Frank Miller is a comic book artist, writer, and movie director who is known for his edgy storytelling. He is one of very few creators who has worked on major projects both for Marvel and DC Comics. Some of his most popular works are Daredevil, Sin City, 300, and Batman The Dark Knight. While you may have seen his name on the cover of a comic book or in the movie credits, few people know the story of how Frank Miller went from being a comic book fan growing up in a small town in Vermont to someone who has gained international fame and fortune. And in the biographics video today, well, we're going to tell you all about him. Frank Miller was born in Olney, Maryland on January 27, 1957, into a large Irish Catholic family. His mother was a nurse and his father ran his own business as an electrician and carpenter. Frank's family moved to Montpellier, Vermont, where he grew up with his six siblings. When he was six years old, Frank Miller bought his first Batman comic book. He loved reading the comics so much that he began drawing Batman on pieces of scrap paper. He took some of his parents' typewriter paper so that he could fold and staple the pages together into a small comic book. He then drew his first comic and presented it to his mother, saying that this was what he was going to do when he grew up. His father became a traveling salesman, and he would drive back and forth between Vermont and New York City. Frank would go with him on these road trips, just so he could look through the big comic book stores in New York and buy all of the different titles that he couldn't get in his small town in Vermont. For the rest of his young life, he would read comics and practice drawing in the hopes that he could make his dreams come true. Growing up, his favorite movies to watch were film noir movies like A Touch of Evil and Chinatown. These stories, they always had a lot of action with corrupt detectives and beautiful femme fatales. He especially loved the movies that were in black and white because of the drama that filmmakers were able to achieve with all of the dark shadows on the screen. Over the years, he read every comic he could get his hands on. He wasn't just enjoying the stories as a fan, he was analyzing both the writing and the artwork, absorbing every little detail. He would read every new character published by Marvel Comics, including one called The Cat, Claws of the Cat, which premiered in November of 1972. When he was 16 years old, he wrote a fan letter to Marvel Comics soon after reading this new comic. This letter was published in issue number three. In the letter, he wrote, Wonderful. At last, a woman character with character. I, for one, am sick of the helpless female types which have cluttered up comics for so long. This woman that Frank Miller was talking about would end up being renamed Tigra. And while many people have not heard of this superhero today, she would be an inspiration for how he portrayed his female characters in the future. Even though they'd only responded to his fan letter, it was still existing exhilarating to see his name in print. Still, he always knew that he wanted to draw comics for the rest of his life, and he felt ready to leave his parents' home. On one of these long road trips with his father, he packed a few extra bags with the intention of moving to New York City when he was only 17. All his life, Frank Miller dreamed of permanently getting out of the countryside, and he was exhilarated to be surrounded by the city that he was so in love with. One of the first things that he did was visit the Empire State Building. At the time, there were no screens up to prevent people from falling over the ledge if they went to the very top. Therefore, Miller was able to sit up on the ledge with his sketchbook and he was drawing the skyline. He kept on sitting on rooftops to get a sense of the city from those angles. These drawings would eventually end up in his later comics. Miller lived in a tiny studio apartment and he was able to use the carpentry skills he'd learned by working at his father's business to find gigs that would help him pay his rent. The apartment was very small and old and there were cockroaches and water bugs crawling all over the place. He was motivated to work for a better life and to try and start his career. Therefore, he started making appointments and taking his drawing portfolio to various comic book publishers around New York. He met with Joe Orlando at DC Comics, who told Miller that he was not good enough to work for them and he might never be. His portfolio was held together with strings and bugs that crawled inside it at some point. As we were talking, one of these pests crawled out of my portfolio into my lap and I could do nothing but cup my little friends during the interview as it squirmed and desperately fought for its life. It was not the brightest day of my life. Needless to say, he did not get that job. That level of constant humiliation, it would have been enough for some people to pack their bags and move back home. And for a while, it truly did seem as if Miller's dream would never become a reality. But he never gave up. With every rejection, he kept trying to improve and he went to more and more interviews. 
Frank Miller's favorite artist by far was Neil Adams, whose Batman and Green Lantern comics had made him a big superstar. He had a background in advertising, so his pictures had an element of photorealism with accurate anatomy. He was looking for more of Adams' work and trying to aspire to be like him. When he went on an interview at Marvel Comics, he actually got to meet Neil Adams, and he let him know how much he admired his work. Adams credits his daughter with his decision to give Miller a chance. He stated, Obviously, she felt sorry for him because he was a skinny kid who looked like Ichabod Crane. He went on to say that Miller's portfolio was, quote, awful. It was so bad, my heart sunk, and I was like, oh my god, one of these guys. Even though he harshly criticized his work too, he graciously called up one of his friends to help Frank Miller get a job as a storyboard artist at an advertising firm. The artwork that was required for these kind of jobs did not need to be as realistic as a Marvel comic book, and this way Miller was able to get professional experience and get tips from co-workers on a daily basis. Now that Frank Miller was a working artist, he no longer had to struggle to find carpentry work to pay the bills. He was drawing for a living, and he was getting better during the process. But he still wanted to do comics. Every time Miller thought that maybe he had improved his art enough, he would go to Neil Adams and apply to work at Marvel again. It took a very long time to truly understand how to improve. Adams would take Miller's drawings and place a piece of tracing paper over the top so that he could draw his own version, showing how to properly redraw the same image. He then pushed the copy paper towards Miller as if to say, try again. After watching Neil Adams so many times, he began to study anatomy textbooks to get a good feeling for drawing the human body. He realized that his biggest problem was creating accurate proportions and understanding how muscles and bones move together. He would practice these tips that Adams gave him and came back again and again. Finally, one day Neil Adams looked at the drawings and picked up the phone to call one of his connections and to get him a job with Gold Key Comics. Adams said, Whatever you do, don't say that I'm responsible for Frank Miller. I've done the same thing for a hundred guys, and nobody responded the way Frank did. Nobody advanced that quickly, and I made it hard for him. If you'd gone through it, you'd have gone home crying. They were publishing the comic book version of The Twilight Zone. There were very few copies made because it wasn't an incredibly popular comic, but Frank Miller was still over the moon because this was his chance to get his foot in the door of the industry. He was so nervous about doing a good job with his first paid gig that it took him three weeks to complete just three pages. But this was just the beginning of his career as a comic book artist. After this, he started getting small gigs at both DC and Marvel, and had truly begun his journey to success. As time went on, Frank Miller had enough professional experience under his belt to be hired as a full-time artist and writer at Marvel Comics for the series Daredevil. Stan Lee and artist Bill Everett had created Daredevil, but Frank Miller is responsible for the dark and gritty hard edge that defined the character. He was able to explore New York's Hell's Kitchen firsthand and accurately capture the essence of this area. Since Miller was raised Irish Catholic, he was also able to bring a lot of the internal struggles felt by Daredevil's secret identity Matt Murdock, whose religious beliefs stopped him from killing bad guys. At that time, Frank Miller had no aspirations to make original characters. He was just thrilled to finally have a steady job working in the comic book industry. But it was clear that he had a unique artistic style and point of view. He was constantly researching by reading comics from all over the world, and he thought a lot about how he could draw a scene to make the reader slow down and really take their time on each page by giving them a visually interesting world. He eventually created the character Elektra. During an interview, he explained his motivations for creating the character, stating, Daredevil had a lot of girlfriends, but what about one who can kick his butt? She became the first female character who was like the femme fatale of the old film noir movies that he loved so much. She was beautiful, and she couldn't be trusted. She was an assassin, but her love for Matthew Murdock created a feeling of guilt. Sorry to spoil it for those of you who don't know, but we do need to mention that Frank Miller made the decision that Elektra had to die for her crimes, which he did at the hands of the villain Bullseye. Nothing like this had ever been done in comics before, especially with such a popular character. Before this, most characters continued to live on forever, even if they were villains. It was dark, and he showed that he was gearing the series towards adult readers. This also really showed that Frank cared more about the storytelling than he did the popularity. 
Plenty of fans they were upset by the death of Electra, but Frank Miller put the story first without worrying too much about the public opinion. He was writing the story in a way that makes sense for the life and growth of the characters. He knew that Matt Murdock would never be able to settle down and have a happily ever after life with Electra, but they were too in love to ever leave each other. So the only way for him to move on and be with someone else would be if Electra died. In 1983, he left Marvel Comics to work for DC. He published a series called Ronin, which was about a samurai warrior. Frank Miller had been inspired by French comics and Japanese manga, and he borrowed from the styles that he discovered from both of these countries. Specifically, he credits Lone Wolf and Cub by Kazuo Koika as being his biggest influence, as well as the work of Jean Garard, who goes by the pen name Mobius. Frank Miller began working together with an artist at DC Comics named Lynn Varley, who inked and colored the drawings of Ronin. They worked incredibly well together, bouncing ideas off one another constantly. She continued to do the inking on all of his future work. They also fell in love and eventually got married. Sadly, they divorced in 2005. DC loved his work so much that they asked him to write and draw a new Batman series. At first, he actually said no, because he respected Batman as a character too much. After all, it was the very first comic that he'd ever read, and he knew that the character meant just as much to millions of people around the world as it meant to him. Even though he was working full-time in the comic book industry, those feelings of self-doubt, they were still there. He was afraid that he wasn't good enough and that he might ruin Batman. However, he did keep the thought in the back of his mind. For years, the character of Batman had never aged. He was permanently 29 years old, and Robin was always his teenage sidekick. He thought to himself, I'll be damned if I'm older than Batman. And it was at this point that he had a light bulb moment. He imagined Batman in his 50s. He's older, disillusioned, and grizzled. And for a man who's been dressing as a bat for so many years, he's certainly going to have some psychological issues. His story of Batman is far darker than any other version that had ever come before it. And this comic was, of course, Batman The Dark Knight Returns. This became a huge success, and it especially resonated with fans who had grown up with the character. The movie adaptation of The Dark Knight in 2008 became one of the most successful superhero stories of all time, and it's arguably the best portrayal of Batman that has ever been made. During an interview at the Cuba School of Media, Frank Miller was asked if he preferred Daredevil or Batman. He very quickly said that Batman will always be number one in his heart because his motivations behind his character are beautifully simple. Batman is trying to restore order to a world where there is none, while the Joker is trying to create chaos. Because of that, the story will stand the test of time. After seeing success in the comic book industry, Frank Miller decided that he wanted to move to a warmer climate, so he left New York and moved to Los Angeles. He had no intention of getting into the movie business, but one day he got a phone call from a movie producer who wanted to work with him on Robocop 2 and 3. Since he loved the first movie, he agreed to work on the projects. However, the director was constantly changing Frank Miller's script. During Robocop 2, he was on set every day wanting to be involved, but by Robocop 3, he got so angry at the movie-making process, he decided to leave and never come back. During an interview, he said, Don't be the writer. The director's got power. The screenplay is a fire hydrant with a row of dogs waiting around the block for it. Miller played small cameo roles in Robocop 2 and 3, and he dies in both films. After getting these small screen credits, he made cameos in some other movies too. In 1994, both Frank Miller and Stan Lee played themselves in a movie called Jugular Wine, a vampire odyssey. There is even a scene where Stan Lee gets to kill Frank Miller. So while he got to enjoy having fun in a campy horror film, he still began to feel jaded. And he didn't feel the same passion for his career that he had back in New York. He really wasn't doing what he actually loved. He began to feel a lot of angst towards Los Angeles. This is what inspired him to write Sin City in 1991. He was inspired to make the story by a black and white comic called Johnny Hazard by Frank Robbins and all of the film noir he had watched as a kid. He sold the idea to Dark Horse Comics. He decided to not hold back and just pour everything that he wanted into the comic. He said he wanted it to have tough guys, beautiful women, and vintage cars. Sin City was released in a series of graphic novels that are standalone stories, but they all exist in the same universe. He continued to work on Sin City for the next few years because it was what he truly enjoyed doing, and he was totally satisfied with it being his one and only project. 
In 2003, a Daredevil movie was released starring Ben Affleck. Since the character rights belonged to Marvel, Frank Miller didn't have any creative input on the film. Many fans felt that this movie did not capture the true essence of the Daredevil comics, and they wouldn't get what they were looking for until Netflix created the original series in 2015, starring Charlie Cox. However, in an interview in 2017, Miller said that he had not even bothered to watch the Netflix series, so he doesn't give any comments about what he personally thinks about those adaptations. Ironically, even though he created the Sin City comic after venting his frustrations with Hollywood, since he really did not enjoy watching adaptations of his work, all of that would circle back in 2005 when he got the opportunity to write and direct the Sin City movie with Robert Rodriguez. At first, Miller said no to the project because Sin City was like his baby, and he had seen what Hollywood had done to his work in the past. But Rodriguez, he was a fan, and he understood how important it was to portray the stories accurately. Rodriguez also gave Frank Miller complete creative control so that he could recreate his comics panel by panel and frame by frame. They worked on showing these screen tests to several different actors, and they were surprised and impressed by the work. He was able to attract a star-studded cast, and even Quentin Tarantino helped to direct the fight scenes in the movie. During an interview about Sin City, he said that he was shocked at how much he enjoyed working together with the actors. He said, I expected the worst, and I got the best. In the behind-the-scenes clips, the feeling seems to be mutual. All of the actors were really happy that they could ask Frank Miller questions about the character's motivations, as well as getting more depth about the overall story. Since then, more of Frank Miller's stories have been adapted to both the small and big screens. He continues to publish new comics on a regular basis. At 62 years old, he is far from retiring anytime soon. In 2018, Netflix ordered a series called Cursed, which is a dark reimagining of the King Arthur legend. Even though he's still making new material, he has already reached legendary status. In a lot of ways, his images define a generation. Today, his work has been on display in a number of art museums, including the Norman Rockwell Museum and even the Louvre in Paris. The work of the young man who was told that he wasn't good enough is now next to some of the greatest artists in the world. The cherry on top of all of this success is that Frank Miller has made quite a lot of money too. He has an estimated net worth of $45 million. He earned his fortune doing what he loved, and doing it extremely well. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below, and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several times a week. If you're looking for something else to watch, though, why not check out my other channel called Top Tens? We do Top Ten videos. We've got a bunch about comics and comic book artists and all of that stuff. So go check out that channel. There's a link below. And as always, thank you for watching.